So I think we're, we're going to start. Um, maybe some other participants will join in a few minutes. Uh, so good afternoon, good morning for those who are in France. I'm Mariana Lusada, and on behalf of the French Lab, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar in which we will discuss how the pandemic has been affecting international research and academic collaborations. Um, I'm representing here the French Lab that aims to gather the academic and business research community in Singapore. And this event is part of the Voila uh, France-Singapore France Festival um, that will take place during this month. Uh, so you have a lot of events that you can check uh, on the Voila uh, website. I also will um, encourage you to visit the French Lab uh, website to find more information about our activities in Singapore. Um, I would like, I would especially like to thank our distinguished speakers uh, who accepted to share their experiences in this panel session and who are representing different sectors, universities, national research agencies, and the corporate world. Uh, they will share their strategies to deal with the current crisis. Just before starting, a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, you have been muted on entry. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat panel to type in your questions. Uh, we will make sure we will respond. Without further ado, uh, please let me introduce our speakers. Uh, we have the honor to have Lindsay Allen, who is a Senior Associate Director, International Programs at Yale and US College. She has been the Head of the Exchange and Study Abroad Program at Yale and US which is Singapore's first liberal arts college founded in 20, uh, 2018 through a partnership between Yale University and the National University of Singapore. Professor Charles Duarte Villain is Vice President of International Strategy at Université de Paris. Um, Université de Paris is an all new university because it was born on January 2020 this year, but out of the merger of three other institutions, Paris Descartes, Paris Diderot, and the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris, who have been working with the National University of Singapore for many years. Uh, Alexandra Ross, Dr. Alexandra Ross, is the Vice President Research and Development for, at the Center for Innovation and Technology, AMERA and China at ESSILOR. Uh, Alexandra has been working with ESSILOR since 20, uh, 2003, and in 2017, she took the leadership of the Center for Innovations and Technologies in Singapore, housing 50 researchers. In 2019, she also kick-started a new recent center in Shanghai, China. Finally, last but not least, uh, Dr. Thomas Luthier, he's a visiting scientist in Biotrans at ASTAR, and he's a, a French CNRS researcher in the field of biotechnology. As we all know, COVID-19 has dramatically changed the way we live and work, and it has particularly affected international collaborations in research and academic partnerships. Um, we're gonna start with the academic partnerships because Singapore and France have taken very different approaches to uh, international academic exchanges. Uh, Singapore decided very early during the crisis that they will stop the exchanges, uh, student exchanges and faculty exchanges for the semester, and they also repatriate all the international, all their students that had abroad. Um, France decided to deal with it in a case by case basis and um, maintain the international exchanges uh, with certain conditions. So maybe Lindsay, you can, we can start with you. Um, can you tell us um, what did you do? Um, what did you do when the pandemic started? Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your work and how uh, Yale and US and NUS reacted uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Sure, wonderful. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you everyone for making time to join us. I'm, I'm honored to be part of this panel. Um, so yeah, I, in, in normal non-COVID times, uh, my job is 
basically overseeing hundreds of students traveling all over the globe back and forth between Singapore and uh, 30 or 40 countries all over the world. So certainly my my particular responsibilities with within uh, Yale and US College have been impacted dramatically. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with Yale and US, as Mariana said, we are uh, the first liberal arts college uh, here in Singapore. And as the name would suggest, founded jointly um, through a collaboration between Yale University and the National University of Singapore. Um, we're quite small. We have a thousand students in total, and that is, I think, one of the factors that maybe also influenced the way we responded to the pandemic. And so maybe that will come up later in conversation. But um, I thought I would mention that we're quite small, and we're also quite international. We're about forty-five percent non-Singaporean students um, from student from about sixty countries all over the world. So that makes makes travel during times of COVID even more complicated. So. Yeah, with, with that, um, yeah, when the pandemic started, I mean, it started in our corner of the world, right? It started in China. I think it, Singapore was, was watching it, of course, very closely. Um, and Singapore and US, Yale and US responded very quickly. Um, I think the first email that went out to our community was on January 25th, outlining sort of our um, sort of pandemic protocols at that stage. Um, obviously, things escalated quickly for all of us. And by about the middle of March, the Ministry of Education told all of the universities in Singapore that we had to bring everybody home immediately, um, of course, on a Saturday night. So <laughs> we started working immediately. And um, my from Yale and US, we had 110 students who were abroad at that point. Um, they were in 22 different countries. And between them, they held 30 different passports. Um, so that made for some very exciting travel planning. Um, we had nine students in France, um, many more across Europe. Um, and within about two weeks, we brought them all back either to Singapore or to their home countries if we could get them home. Um, so we then had to close our campus in early April, um, meaning the exchange students, many of our, of our exchange students actually had opted who were here in Singapore opted to stay uh, because they felt like Singapore actually was maybe a safer place to be at that point. But we had to close our campus in early April and send uh, students home, including 12 students who we had here from, um, from France that semester. Uh, so yeah, as Mariana mentioned, we've exchange was suspended very quickly. It is still suspended. Actually, we just made the very, painful decision very recently to suspend again for the upcoming semester that will start in January. So no outbound and no incoming. Um, so that's that's a bit where we are now. Um, and Mariana, I'm not sure how much, how much you want me to say at this point, I can talk a little bit about some of the things we've done, but perhaps we'll save that for the next round of questions. Sure, maybe uh, Charles-Edouard, um, can you tell us a little bit how um, the pandemic hit it Paris, uh, what you have to do in terms of, you know, the students that you had abroad and the international students that you had um, at Université de Paris. Yes, um, well, thank you very much for having me, Mariana. And it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be um, part of this um, virtual debate. Um, well, um, it was difficult. Uh, University of Paris was founded on the 1st of January. And um, we des I decided to call an emergency meeting on the 20th of January. We had 25 students in the Hubei province and two in Wuhan. Part, they're part of the uh, Department of Asian Studies. Um, and so um, I think we did quite a good job, actually, of anticipating what needed to be done, given that at this point uh, in mid-January in France, we had little information on the gravity of the situation. And we thought we need to focus on the, student, the exchange students who are located in the Hubei province and particularly in, in Wuhan, where um, the two Wuhan-based students were repatriated uh, as speedily as possible. But we had a bit of a problem with the 23 others because it was the um, uh, a special time, of course, in China. And they were rather unconvinced by our arguments that this was a very grave health crisis. So I really had to push them very hard and even including their families. And this is like something I discussed with my counterpart, Victor, to tell them that actually this was serious. So would you please return to France? And it took another two weeks for them to start, you know, um, understanding that, you know, we were not trying to restrict their liberties, but actually to take care of their welfare. And after that, it was very much a case, you know, case by case situation. We had other students in Asia and South Korea. Uh, in Japan, and you know, um, as we began to realize how serious and how grave the situation was, we get, began repatriating students, and then came lockdown in March, as Lindsay mentioned, um, 
you know, we were hard hit by number one, the crisis and then the lockdown and we're back to lockdown uh, or rather back into the future, I would say as of tomorrow. So we need to um, assess the situation again. Just to wrap this up very briefly, um, exchanges were not suspended. We took um, a difficult decision in June as a result of the lockdown, the situation very much improved in France. Uh, so in the spring of 2020, we decided that we'd open uh, exchanges again, but under very strict conditions, particularly with regards to um, um, all the exchanges outside the EU space. Regarding the EU space, our decisions were very much contingent, very much contingent on the um, more global European EU response uh, of the Erasmus uh, Agency. Thank you very much, Charles Edouard. Um, we have indeed two very different perspectives, but at the beginning they started the same with uh, the crisis in China, and uh, then you basically took different path, uh, deciding whether you will continue or suspend the exchanges um, with other countries. Maybe we can hear now from uh, what you've done in the corporate world. Alexandra, maybe you can share um, a little bit about your work, uh, your international collaborations, and what happened uh, when the pandemic started. Thank you, Mariana. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very pleased also to be part of this, uh, this panel. Um, so for us, so uh, we in SLR here, our R&D center is, is 50 people, as you mentioned. And uh, SLR R&D altogether is about 450, 460 people, uh, mostly in France. Um, and some in Dallas, uh, Texas, in the US. And uh, as you mentioned at the beginning also, I have a team of eight people in Shanghai, China. So um, that's quite uh, a bit everywhere. So what happened to us is that we faced all the lockdowns uh, one after another. Uh, it was a kind of sequence, you know, like a domino uh, game. It started, of course, by China um, uh, on uh, January 25th when Wuhan was a lockdown. So we, we, I don't have any team, we don't have any team in Wuhan itself, but Shanghai is not too far. So everything started there. The whole world and including, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but in France at that time, people were looking at China with big eyes and saying, what are they doing? Locking down uh, a town of uh, 10 or 13 million, I don't remember now how big is Wuhan people. And uh, looking at our Shanghai colleagues, uh, kind of, uh, they are going to infect us through uh, Hangout or Zoom video. And then it was quite, um, then we, we were more, I mean, uh, we were getting more sense of what's happening because we are closer to them. We could see them on our, their everyday. So they were on holidays at that time, but they did not go back to office right after the holidays were extended. You, you may all know that. I mean, from people that are here, everyone knows it. And then we saw it arriving here in, in Singapore where we started having some restrictions, um, uh, both on the daily life and uh, in the office place. And I was myself in France for work because um, I mean, we are here in Singapore, a bit far from our main R&D center in France, uh, and we cover the whole Asian region. So India, we have partnerships in India, China, Australia, Vietnam, Japan. So uh, early, um, I was just looking at my calendar to remember these old times. I'm not sure it was good old times, but first week of January, I was in Japan. Uh, second week of January, I was in Bangkok. Uh, third week, uh, no, not third week, no, I was first, sorry, in China, second week in Japan, third week um, in, um, in Bangkok, and after everything stopped, but I was myself in France on the second week of March, just before everything collapsed, uh, when I say that, that the lockdown started in France on, on March 14th, I think, so I came back here, uh, and then after I, we repatriated all the stuff, we had a bit in India, China, everywhere. So we did it quite, uh, I would say maybe we're more um, alert about that than in France. In France it was a big big hit at that time, a big shock. Uh, but uh, also, it's, I'm not talking about students because we don't have so many students, but uh, all our uh, staff members uh, could come back, some of them in quarantine, etc. And uh, we were, I would say, the last one that were uh, hit by the, the lockdown beginning of April here, the, the secret breakout. So we were the last man standing 
uh, really, yeah, because the, uh, we had some work from France that they were asking us to do in our Dean Center here. So it was a kind again of domino of dominoes. The thing is that we started again first too, because here the circuit breaker we had in the so we are in the eye care business. We were essential business um, having labs, so we were authorized by MOM to start uh, to start, and we restarted on. Uh, uh, May 11th or something like that. So the, 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 the stop was very short for our team here. The last one to close and the first one to reopen. So actually, um, if I look at that on a broader point of view on SLR R&D, we were not hit that much. Uh, we could, we could uh, and we worked from home fully five weeks. It was good enough for many people to do catch up all the work we never have time to do. So it was uh, quite nice. And then maybe later on, I will talk about the partnership outside, but nothing stopped, actually. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Very interesting. Maybe now we can um, discuss with um, Thomas. Uh, Thomas, you are a visiting scientist at ASTAR, which is a national uh, research agency in Singapore. And you're part of a joint lab. Uh, it's a CNRS lab uh, between France and Singapore. So maybe you can share you know, uh, how the pandemic affected your work. Um, and what you did at that time. Yeah, sure. So thanks for the, the invitation. So, so I'm a researcher. So my daily day, uh, I'm, I'm working on the bench on a daily basis. So I need to, to be in a lab for wet biology. Uh, and uh, we also have some uh, students, PhD students, and uh, a strong link between France and um, Singapore due to this international joint laboratory. So, uh, a star is a um, Singaporean agency, and uh, they decided first to, after the lockdown, to make a team A and team B organization in order to have um, a, a continuous activity for the lab. And for uh, for A star, it was very important because there is a lot of industrial partnership, and we cannot take some delay in the, in the project and so on. So for us, it was quite a new uh, way of working because uh, you cannot stop biological experiment uh, when you are in team A, the B week, because the cells are growing and so on. It's a lot of work to, to start again each time. So it's um, obliged us to communicate more inside the teams in order to exchange the experiments, the samples, uh, and have this uh, continuous workflow. So basically, it was very interesting, this kind of new management. So take the samples of the students and the day after, the week after, give my sample to the students and um, you, you build a, a kind of a, a reciproc uh, trust between the, the team members. So it was a very positive for this. But then you have one student which is uh, at home uh, one week, uh, so cannot work kind of do experiments. So we, we had to also think differently how we can approach biology. So we develop a lot of uh, bioinformatic approaches. So in other words, uh, improve the design step of the experiments and after validate in the weeks that you are in the lab. So basically uh, think more before acting. It was also positive and uh, honestly cost saving because uh, Rather than making uh, 50 experiments, you just do five because you have only one day in the lab. And on, among these five, you, you, you must succeed. Uh, then, I don't know for you, but for us, uh, geographic distance reduce with, uh, with the lockdown because all the planets switch to Zoom and, uh, and Skype. So basically, it was much more easier to be integrated with uh, friends, uh, team meetings, and so on because uh, everyone was uh, was on, on video. This was uh, also a nice uh, nice input of this. Um, and also, what I really appreciate during this time is uh, it was a time of uh, introspection, uh, which is uh, crucial for creativity and for science design. So when you are uh, locked down in a little flat in Singapore with uh, no family and so on. Uh, you have this kind of uh, monk life. Yeah, so you, you, you have time to think and to really explore new ideas. So I really appreciate this. And this I try to, to keep now, uh, and, but this is only the first step. So first you, 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 you think to new ideas 
And then you build a network with the visual and so on to discuss these ideas. And uh, it's after this uh, lockdown, we, we had several new projects and new collaboration uh, starting due to this kind of uh, free time reflection. Thank you, Thomas. Your last comment um, helped me to transition to the second question will be how you adjust to this new normal, because of course our, cha our life changed uh, with this, as you said, you know, uh, we are not able to travel or to go to the lab every day. Uh, all our meetings are taking place on Zoom or any, you know, online. Um, so maybe you can also share, I don't know if uh, Charles Varlin, so how uh, you're now adjusting to this new normal. Uh, maybe Lindsay, you can uh, tell us, you know, there are no more exchanges. Uh, Basically, you repatriate the Singaporean students who, or, or the Egalian US students who were abroad. Uh, you are not accepting international students for the semester. Um, so how are you helping the students to get international exposure or to benefit uh, from internationalization in this new normal? Yeah, thank you. That's sort of the million dollar question. So I will I'll do my best to do justice to that. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think there have been a couple of, of things that we've really, I think, been forced to do. I think, um, first of all, do just kind of do what we can. Right. I think we sort of had to be creative. I, I work in a center that, um, in addition to managing exchange and study abroad, also supports internships, uh, research opportunities for students. Um, support students in graduate school advising and a lot of other programming. So part of what we did actually once the sort of initial crisis of, of bringing the students back to wherever we needed them to be um, was to look at what programming can we still run with what what works virtually what works uh, locally here in Singapore and you know, in some ways it actually sort of forced us to invest a little bit more deeply in some relationships here in Singapore um, within our community in terms of new internship opportunities as things were falling apart and getting canceled. Um, and also to connect our students with internship opportunities abroad, like Tomas was saying, the, the Zoom is sort of the great equalizer these days. And it doesn't really matter if, the, if your boss is in Paris or in Singapore, if you're in Singapore. So um, we actually had quite a few students engaging in international internships virtually this summer, which was actually kind of exciting, um, as well as a handful of academic uh, experiences that were done virtually. So. That was sort of the very immediate um, for our, our summer break that was was you know fast approaching during the the immediate months of the pandemic. Um, we also you know one of the things that what a big piece of my work is building partnerships with other universities around the world and in investing in those partnerships and and strengthening our ties. And when nobody can get on an airplane, that becomes a lot more difficult. Um, but one of the things that um, that we really in invested in was we have a lot of partners in North America, especially, um, but also outside of North America who have a lot of Singaporean students. And those students had fled their campuses in March, come home to Singapore. And now we're facing the prospect of getting back on an airplane, which maybe mom and dad weren't very excited about um, to head back to say the United States. So we actually reached out over the summer to a lot of our university partners around the world and offered to host their Singaporean students this semester. So we're actually hosting 17 sort of exchange students, local exchangers, uh, Singaporeans, um, and they're spending their semester with us living on campus, taking classes and I mean it's not the same as bringing in students from further afield, but it actually has been kind of a wonderful experience. They're bringing really different perspectives from their campuses. Several of them come from Yale, um, which has helped us to sort of deepen our partnership with one of our parent institutions. Um, and some of them come from universities that actually we've never worked with. Um, they just heard about us through their, their friends. And so we actually may end up benefiting by building some new partnerships because of the pandemic, not in spite of it, which is actually kind of exciting. Um, I think the the other thing that we've been really focusing on is just sort of 
defining our priorities, you know, in addition to travel restrictions, budgets are, are getting tighter, staff restrictions are more complicated, we can't all be in the office at the same time anymore. It, it's, it really forces a lot of, of interesting conversations and I, those moments of introspection, I think, are, are helpful now. And I think we've really um, had to sort of focus on what are we trying to get our students to achieve? How do we turn actually this for some of them, pretty big disappointment. You know, they thought they were going to spend a semester abroad. Now it's probably not going to happen before they graduate. How do you turn that actual disappointment into a learning experience itself and sort of coach the students to build their resilience and um, build their flexibility, which we know is going to be important for them in their, in their professional lives ahead. So those are our aspirations at any rate for now. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Charles Edouard, um, we know that in well in France, of course, you repatriated those who were in China. Um, uh, you maintain the exchanges within the European Union. Uh, so maybe well, <laughs> today is a special day uh, because France will be under lockdown starting tonight. Uh, but you being receiving and sending some students abroad the past semester and, and this semester, right? So um, how did you adjust to this new normal? Um, typical question, Mariana. We took the risk, as I said, of um, not of freezing um, exchanges um, in the spring, the early summer of 2020. But we did so under very stringent conditions because our priority is, of course, the, our, our students' um, uh, welfare. Um, today, I pulled out the figures yesterday to, to, you know, to get an update on the figures. We have uh, in the second semester, it is the plan to have 140 students outside the EU, uh, approximately um, 50 in the inside within the EU space. Um, now, I think there are different issues at stake. Um, for us, I think the big thing, of course, is the explosion of uh, online learning, um, for which to be very, I'll be very candid with you, uh, I don't think we were fully prepared. It is something that was completely unexpected. That was an ongoing process. And I'd be lying to you to, if I said to you, you know, um, not only had we anticipated there'd be a world pandemic, but of course, in terms of online teaching, we were fully prepared. We were not. And this is, of course, um, um, you know, boosting the reasons we now have uh, to be, you know, uh, in full shape. Because clearly um, the students, as Lindsay mentioned, they do, they do seek international exposure, but they understand now that the context has radically changed and that we live in a completely different world. Um, I'll take a, an example. Um, in the spring of 2020, when we had to take this difficult decision regarding international mobilities, my position, that was a personal position, was to say, look, we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't have a vaccine. This is a, a very unpredictable virus. I think my suggestion is to freeze all mobilities until Christmas of 2020, so can, we can warm up for 2021. And we had a big decision uh, within uh, Upari. And the big problem we had is that because we had had a lockdown and it led to a rather successful result, that was after March, April and May 2020, it was impossible, impossible to explain to our students that now that they had made this huge effort, the reward was that mobilities were going to be frozen for another six months. I realized that this is, this is where you see that you really are teetering on an edge between a, shall we say, a medical decision and a, globe, a more global political and administrative approach. And this is where I realized that I was doing, we were doing an impossible job. And so basically we, you know, we compromised, we said, look, uh, we'll, we'll let you uh, leave for not just the EU countries, if it's possible, if Erasmus, the Erasmus agency agrees, but also outside Europe, particularly the Asian space, uh, also the North American space, but under very strict conditions. But we'll have to have very, very stringent conditions because we don't want to go through the nightmare we had to go through in February, March and April 2020. And that you can understand. So that's the first response to your question. Um, the second one is how well are they adjusting to online teaching? I think rather well. I happen to, I have a, a, um, a, a small teaching load and I have students who are, who log into my, um, my, my classes online from abroad. EU students who are based in Austria or in Great Britain, 
And they're actually, you know, I try my best to, to, you know, to teach a lively class, despite the fact that it's online, and, and they're quite happy to be part of a, another community. So I'm not, I, I, you know, it's given the circumstances, I think it's, it's all right. The big problem, I think, is what Lindsay was mentioning, is the cultural factor. One thing is um, online teaching, you know, the fact that, you know, students are part of a different community, a virtual community. Another one is the cultural immersion abroad. Typically, we have in the Department of uh, East Asian Studies, uh, we have people who work in, you know, Korean studies. And they were left with a very, you know, powerful dilemma. Are you going to stay in France and log into, um, you know, your classes? in Seoul, for example, at Seoul University, uh, with the time difference, of course, problem. Are you going to log in from Paris or would you rather log in from Seoul where you'll be best? That was a big question, not to mention the, the quarantine issue once you've arrived. And uh, the decision we took in the spring was to say, well, look, we'll let you leave for Korea because clearly you need you know, an immersion and this is your year abroad. And there is also the time difference. You know, we, you begin in Korea, you know, say classes begin at, you know, 9 a.m. We're in the middle of the night in Europe. So how do you handle this problem? And we can't ask that Seoul University to adjust to French time. It's impossible. So we decided to let them, you know, leave for Korea under very stringent conditions. And they are, they're, they're currently in Seoul. And I'm not saying they're having a great time. It's very difficult, clearly. They're, you know, miles away from their families. Uh, the circumstances are very special, but I think they're, you know, it's the best they can make of the current situation. And final point to conclude um, regarding what Lindsay was mentioning, that is um, exchanges with colleagues and, you know, partner universities. Well, we're very lucky to have someone like you, Mariana, clearly you're the, the link person. And I, you know, I think it's, um, I discussed this with Victor, uh, establishing links. I would say there's a difference between nurturing old links uh, virtually, that, that is something that I find feasible because there's a story behind a partnership. I think more problematic, I find, especially for us because we're a new university, so we're looking you know, at new horizons. More tricky, I would say, more challenging is the establishment of new partnerships with people you do not yet know. I mean, typically our science faculty has huge ambitions with regards to Canada, and I completely understand them. I think it's a great thing. The problem is that we do have a lot of contacts with Canadian universities, but they want something new. And something new with people you've never met, virtually, I find is a big, big challenge. And I think, um, so, you know, nurturing old partnerships as we do with NUS, for example, for which there's a story, for which we have people, people we know, people we can trust, we can rely on, is feasible. More difficult, I find, in the given in the current circumstances, is um, exploring new territories, and not just in Asia. In Africa, for example, we have big ambitions on the African continent, in North America, in South America, everywhere in the world. We don't want to rule any territories out of the picture. But the problem is, what do we do with you know old partnerships that we can deal with? New partnerships, I don't have the answer to the question, and I don't know how we're going to do it. So I hope this is there's going to be an end to this story. Um, I, I, it's, it's great to have, you know, virtual meetings to um, see people on their, you know, screens and so on. But then there is, you know, we're, you know, human beings, we're not made to have, you know, virtual interactions, virtual conversations. We do want to get together, as um, Alexandra rightly said, you know, meeting people, you know, in person is actually what we're made for. It's not, you know, about, you know, the rest of our lives, you know, sitting around virtual tables. And that's, that is my only concern for the future. Thank you, Charles Edouard, and thank you very much for saying, well, that my presence here is uh, useful for the partnership. Um, it is something that I also discussed with Alexandra uh, a few days ago. Uh, Alexandra, you speak Mandarin, and I think um, in Chinese, it's you, uh, you use the same word for crisis and opportunity, correct? Actually, I discovered that when you <laughs> said it, yeah, but in Chinese, the word crisis is uh, two uh, Chinese characters. The first is uh, hazard and the second is opportunity. It's always very nice in Chinese uh, uh, when you have two, uh, I mean, it's, you have many, many uh, stories like that. So, 
So you mentioned that the fact that, um, you know, Essilor, which is a French company, has a research and development center based here in, in Singapore covering the region. It was very helpful during this pandemic because it allowed to, you know, continue working from here without the need of traveling back and forth. So maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more about how you adjusted to this new normal. Yeah, so it's quite interesting also what uh, Charles Edouard had said uh, about the new partnerships and the old ones. So just before, I mean, that's clear. Uh, we, we've been having partnerships. So in China, we have a joint R&D center in Wenzhou, Zhejiang, uh, for six, seven years. So with them, even if they were in a lockdown themselves, it's because Wenzhou was also under lockdown during uh, some time. We could, we know them very well. And uh, so even, it's not even by video, by the way, it's uh, by WeChat. It's by, by, by texting that we could go on the relationship. So it, this, is, this was very easy. Um, for the new partnerships, we succeeded to set up two new ones. And one was with Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And you may know that Hong Kong has, how to say, piled the, the problems, political problems first and after COVID. So it was very complicated just to know if they were, they could work. I mean, in the university and the collaboration we were setting with them. Um, but I mean, we succeeded. And as I said, I mean, maybe we are lucky or whatever, but um, what has really appeared during this time is that our small team of 50 people out of the 450, we became, I would not say more important, but more, um, I don't know if you say that in English, pivotal, which means that um, now we are a relay for the main uh, the central part um, to the region. We were, I mean, at least in our missions. And, and again, we have a lot of partnerships all around. And, and not only, by the way, with academic institutions, but with companies sometimes. Um, and also with inside uh, our company, with the business, with the marketing teams, etc. And so now, I would not say that we feel more important, but a little bit, which is that I have uh, colleagues in the front saying, Alexandra, can you help us on that? Because with the distance, only the video, the cultural difference that you mentioned, uh, we can't do it. We can't do it. We can't travel and uh, we don't know the people, uh, etc. So we are really a relay for um, on, on different topics, quite key for the company. I mean, in terms of our research and development. And that, that's new. That's really new. But even though, again, we're working a lot, but now it's uh, we feel like, um, how to say, uh, uh, a critical link uh, between uh, between Europe and uh, and partners here. When I say here, it's the whole uh, the whole region. About the new normal, I will I would like to add something. Is that in our um, so I don't know how it is in the academic part. And, and I heard Thomas talking about the bench. Uh, so of course we need also to have some access uh, to the bench, but not for the whole team. There is something which is really new: is um, the time difference management. So we used to manage that by traveling, being jet lagged. Uh, you know, you go four days in France, you come back, uh, you are totally uh, uh, off. And uh, the next week you go to China, etc. Um, now we don't move here. You see my, I mean, my, my nice comfortable chair now. Um, but the, the, the way we manage, and it's not for the whole team, but for many people in the team, uh, the time of the day has totally changed. I myself experienced being jet lagged without moving from this chair because I had consecutive days of late night meetings. And the third day, honestly, it was 4 p.m. I didn't know what time it was um, because I had woken up at 10 a.m., started the, the breakfast at uh, 12, etc. So this is quite interesting because actually, so it's less tiring, of course, than traveling. And um, there are um, many people uh, having opportunities out of that, changing their work-life balance uh, working more, uh, being more with more production, I would say. Uh, but yet, and I'm sorry, you may have heard my son. That's also the new normal <laughs> in terms of of uh, of work. Um, but yeah, it's about managing uh, our own time in a different manner. Not being the 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. a bit. You know, we go to work. And, uh, oh, it's late. I have to go back. And uh, no, it's it's really more flexibility, more agility. Uh, for the whole team, even at the bench, they do staggered hours. At the very beginning, we also had team A and team B, like Thomas. 
but there were some people they had to be really on site for two three hours during the day so the the, the recommendation for the, not the recommendation the, the the request was for them to be on site only during these three hours so and these people they've been work, coming to work again 9 a.m to 6 p.m for years and now it was quite new and everyone is taking a lot of benefit out of that so um, I'm usually quite optimistic and our team is uh, too, but uh, really, I think it's a better way of working now um, than, than before. That's, that's very interesting. I, you know, um, I feel the same way uh, as you in many ways um, because I was traveling a lot too. And, and well, now it's like everything is happening from home. Um, but yeah, so it also uh, an opportunity to learn new things. So maybe I would like to ask Thomas, uh, what do you think are the lessons learned? I think that for you, the 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 circuit breaker, so it's our lockdown in Singapore was very very beneficial. You you mentioned this when we discuss. Uh, you create new uh, relationship with your colleagues. Uh, so maybe Thomas, you can share with us. Yeah, what are the lessons that you learn uh, through this period? I think um, what I've learned mainly is um, if you slow down, you will go faster. Uh, in other words, uh, just think a little bit more and you will be more efficient, more focused well, on the key point of your experiment or for your project and so on. So this is really the, the, the cornerstone of, uh, of this experience, experiment and this time. And I try to keep this now on, a, on my work. Uh, then I completely agree with what said uh, Charles Edouard and Alexandra about um, uh, human feelings. Uh, I think we have all uh, experimented an uh, uh, oversaturation of uh, visio. I mean, uh, sometimes I, I, I just quit the visio, but uh, I go elsewhere because it's, it's just physically cannot. Um, and it's, I think one of the challenges that we have to, to face now, how can we inject some human feelings in this kind of uh, virtual meetings? So for example, for teaching, you can, you can share some knowledge by video with no worry. But the point is when you go to practical experiment, it's much more difficult. So we've tried to do um, a practical online to a science, uh, scientific class uh, with a French school uh, in, in Singapore. And actually, uh, it was a good challenge because uh, it was uh, uh, for kids of, uh, uh, I think, uh, nine years old. So it was not so easy to handle, uh, conduct an experiment without a direct control in the classroom, but, but we did it. So maybe university, we, we should also try to have this kind of uh, virtual practicals. Then I would like to say that uh, we also think differently our project, our uh, science, and in a, in a virtual way. And this way, in this virtual way, we can share it more easily, a kind of uh, 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 open biology. So for example, uh, just before this meeting, I was in a visio with Paris um, and uh, with uh, Pascal Ersen team. And for example, we can have, have make a design here at home and I will send to them this design and they, will, they can use for another experiment. So there is this kind of uh, synergy effect, which is positive. And last point, uh, I mentioned also that new collaboration is not so easy to handle due to human uh, communication, human issue. You don't know really what is thinking the, the people in front of you. So not so easy to, to bring emotion in, uh, in, uh, in visio. So just one example, uh, so in the lab, one guy, uh, it was uh, his birthday, and uh, for his birthday, he, he couldn't bring some cake, so he just make a, a poem describing a, a French cake, and uh, and he bring a lot of emotion during in, inside the team, inside the lab. So uh, some Singaporean colleagues say, "Oh, you, you you really touch my heart," and so on. So it was uh, really really nice. And other more pragmatic say, "Okay, man, now I want to see the real cake." So, so it was really also interesting to have this kind of. Uh, uh, unexpected communication. And, and by this way, you can bring some humanity in, uh, in the visio. But I think we, we need to dig this and uh, it's, it's crucial now. I had uh, several issue of communication because we are not face-to-face. -face. And when you are face-to-face, -face, it's much more easier to solve. 
Thanks, Thomas. It's true that we are all experiencing uh, some Zoom fatigue and uh, <laughs> it's not getting better. And uh, well, we were expecting that, you know, this will change in the future. I remember when I, I canceled my trip to Paris in January, late January, I thought, well, it doesn't matter. I will go maybe in, in May or very late in June. And we are now um, almost in November and I still don't know when I will be able to go back to France or go anywhere else outside of Singapore. Uh, but it's true that we learn a lot of things and we are trying to um, make things better the best we can uh, with, you know, with the experience that we had in this past month. So um, maybe you can now tell us what your, are your plans for the future? Because this is, um, you know, well, in France, <laughs> Uh, you know, we are in lockdown from tonight. Uh, in Singapore, we we have the possibility to to go out, but we cannot travel. So, um, what are you planning to do? Um, you know, for let's say for the next six months, uh, maybe Lindsay, you can share your plans at Yale and US. Sure, this is, this is very timely because I just came out of a day-long budget meeting thinking about exactly what we want to be doing in fiscal year 2021. So yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're starting to accept, just like you were saying, Mariana, that this is going to probably be with us for a while, both from a sort of medical biological standpoint, but also from a financial standpoint. And the, you know, the, the economy is not necessarily going to bounce back, probably our endowment funds and our, our, just our funding in general is not going to come back for a little while. So it's, it's forcing us to really kind of prioritize. Um, you know, I think we're, we're quite anxious, certainly our students are, and I can identify with the comment earlier about students really, really not understanding why they can't go places um, and, and being very anxious to get back out into the world. So we're certainly anxious to get back to some semblance of normal or whatever we want to call it, the pre-COVID world. But I think we've also been taking this opportunity for all of these reasons, health, financial, et cetera, to really um, emphasize our relationships locally. Um, and I, I'm in, envisioning probably an emphasis on regional partnerships as well, um, which will be interesting for our, our more global partnerships. We'll see. I hope they will they will, and then I, I trust that they will be back in, in due course, but in the short term, we're really looking at partnerships with countries here in APAC where we feel um, perhaps that Singapore has strong enough economic ties that we may be able to move students back and forth um, sooner rather than later. So, and then of course, the, a lot of the focus for all of us, even those of us who aren't counselors is on student well-being and on helping them to sort of um, adjust to this new world that we're in, this very uncertain um, anxiety inducing world, helping them to adjust to disappointments and, and hopefully build some resilience, which um, frankly, even more than the international exposure, especially for students at a place like Yale and US that is already quite international, helping them build that resilience may be one of the most important things we can do right now in terms of launching them successfully into the world as they graduate. So. Thank you, Lindsay. I think we have a few questions uh, from the, the, the participants. Uh, so, good uh, virtual meetings replace business travels for well-established partnerships. This is a question from uh, Celestine Ng. So, I don't know who would like to um, respond. May I, Ayana? Yes. I, I don't think so. I think we will need to travel again and we will need to meet face to face again, even for long term partnerships. This cannot last because there are things that you cannot, uh, I mean, solve um, by, by WeChat. Even if you know the people very well, it's okay for a certain period of time, but to a certain extent. At one point, we will have to go back face to face and and spend, sometimes you need to spend days uh, with people and it's not, you cannot concentrate in a two hour meetings. Uh, in two hour meetings, uh, um, the presence of being in the same rooms or in the same premises and thinking about it and going for lunch and after doing the coffee, having a discussion that you didn't uh, prepare. So no, I mean, virtual meetings will not replace on the long run, um, whatever relationship uh, even if it's well established uh, for, for a long time. 
And for the new ones, for the ones that we have, I, I don't think so. For the ones that we just uh, started, uh, we are just waiting. So there is one with Hong Kong. We are very happy because we will be able to go and come back without quarantine. Um, but we are just waiting for, OK, when can we go? When can we go? Because even if we did everything, we set up everything, the protocol of the study, everything, the contract is signed, things have started there. We we, we want to go there to see, to, to be together because the collaboration, the partnership is a partnership. It's not two entities like that working in parallel. It's people working together. So I, I don't think so. We will have to go back to, so maybe less travels this, yes, I believe in it because, uh, but still the face-to-face -face meeting, you, you will never, it's not meetings, by the way, just being together with the people, um, you will not, never avoid it. I don't think so. Or maybe in a very far future when the civilization will have changed, but this will take some generations about uh, the adaptation of the humankind, I think. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Alexandra, in the sense that, of course, you know, uh, now we learn how to do differently, but it cannot replace um, the contact that you can establish face to face. Um, because I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time and we have other questions. So um, let me go ahead. What's the impact of the crisis on students enrollment on your institutions uh, now and in the long term? Uh, do you see a decrease of uh, Chinese students? Like, like, for example, there was a decrease in Chinese students in Australia. Um, what was your situation in Paris and in Singapore? Maybe Charles Edouard, you want to respond to that question? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I think according to the latest figure, we have an approximate 30% um, drop in terms of um, international mobilities, but I need to um, have the consolidated <clears throat> figures because we're a new university and it's impossible to compare with the two other former universities plus IPGP, so it's a difficult task. Um, uh, we, as you know, we have a different economic model. Um, I mean, it's a free fee system, so it's, you know, unlike, you know, um, other universities across the world, uh, we do have financial issues, of, but of a different kind. Um, now, point three, um, you were asking what the plan was. Sometimes I wonder if COVID doesn't have a plan for us, which worries, worries me a lot. Um, and it, 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 it's a test of, you know, a test of our metal, uh, our resilience, uh, as Lynn say, uh, would say. So basically, you know, we, the plan in the in, in immediate plan really is to survive and adjust. And I want to say that, you know, um, it, the problem we have uh, culturally in France um, is that um, I've just realized that, you know, a lot of people don't take the virus very seriously until something bad happens in their families or, you know, among their relatives. I have a very dear colleague who's gravely ill at the moment, is in hospital. And it's for me, it really has been a wake up call. I've always taken this very seriously. But now, uh, with a different perspective on COVID because I have a very good friend and colleague who's currently in hospital. And, you know, basically it's survive and adjust. Um, so basically, you know, nurturing old partnerships, typically the NUS-UP link, it's a very sturdy partnership and it's an essential asset in our international strategy, yes. Um, and to, to wrap this up very briefly, I'd say that one of the things we've managed to do, Mariano will confirm this, is we've been able to maintain a calls for proposals, for example, in different fields, research, education, PhD mobility. And surprisingly enough, I have to share this information with you. We've had different calls for proposal with uh, NUS in particular, but other universities, and they've, be, they've encountered a huge success. My guess was, given the circumstances, people are not going to, you know, be interested, they're not going to offer anything because they know that the world has changed and that mobilities are, you know, more or less are frozen until the end of, you know, 2020. And um, the result is that we've had a, a similar, similar call for proposals with King's College London, with NUS, and, you know, big numbers, people, you know, respond positively. So the, the, the way I see this is that um, I see this as an act of faith on the part of many colleagues they want to keep, you know, uh, in good spirits. They want to keep faith in the future. And this is something we need to take very seriously. If so many people, despite the circumstances, positively respond to calls for proposals, it probably means something about our mindset. It's difficult. We're going through very difficult times, but people want to believe in the future. Uh, it's an act of faith. 
And I think our job, you're asking me, Mariana, what is our job, is to keep this faith alive. Thanks, Charles Edouard. And um, actually, you're, you partially replied to a question from Stéphane Romet that says, any idea how the crisis is going to slow down or accelerate partnerships and research projects in 2021? As you said, uh, well, for our call for proposals between uh, University of Paris and, and NUS, we received more uh, ap applications this year. I don't know, maybe the perspectives of uh, Alessandra and Thomas, uh, what do you think about the impact of the crisis for next year? Will it accelerate or uh, slow down uh, research between, uh, well, international res research and between France and Singapore in particular? Depends if you are working in biology or not. So for uh, what we have seen is that there is a massive effort and funding for COVID and uh, uh, vaccine uh, research, which makes sense, of course. Um, I'm a little bit worried about uh, what can be considered by uh, by a global population as a less interesting uh, scientific fields because uh, I'm afraid that it will be driven by the emergency. So we need to balance this. Uh, so I think in the in the frame of the vaccine and COVID, yes, there will be a lot of uh, new collaboration and effort and uh, a really nice synergy sharing the, the genome sequences. For example, we have seen that it has it has been done very quickly between various countries. For other fields. Uh, I'm not so sure. Not so easy for now to see uh, if uh, international program will be uh, ongoing or not, and so on. In, in our field, I would say that there are two things helping. Uh, the first, um, I would say, uh, um, uh, the people uh, were wanted and in the team, and I, I saw that, uh, I mean, in team in China and in India, people want to show that uh, things are still going on. So I would say there's even more motivation to, to uh, achieve the goals that, uh, um, that were set um, and, and, and to be even prouder, more proud, I'm sorry, uh, of achieving it uh, against all the constraints. So um, I don't know if this will last because that can be uh, tiring to, to be over motivated to, to get something done. But for the moment, it's quite a nice, uh, a nice, a nice uh, trend. Second, basically for us, so Lindsay, we're talking about budget. There was a lot of budget uh, allocated to travel. That costs a lot. This this money is reallocated to something else. So it's not, I mean, huge, but th that's that's not bad. Huh? I mean, because uh, I mean, you can use it for more partnerships, for hiring new people, maybe not uh, long term contracts, but at least uh, a term contracts uh, a year or so. So uh, again, uh, I think there are many ways to turn the things positively, um, and the money we don't spend in 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 uh, in consuming uh, kerosene in planes uh, can be used for research uh, in some partnerships. So I'm quite happy about that, actually. So we are running out of time, but um, we have two more questions. You know, if you can stay three more minutes. Uh, one from Bao Shang Ong. Uh, so it says because some virtual meetings have instantaneous translated subtitles, this technology is getting more and more accurate. But will this be a loss for bi or multilinguist? So anyone who has an idea who would like to contribute on this? Charles Edouard, do you? <laughs> yes. Um, thank you very much. So um, I think so um, I, I, I don't think um, anyone around this virtual table would describe English as a foreign language. Um, it's a sort of um, second native language for everybody around the world. Um, there are other, you know, very, very important languages, of course, it's not just English, Chinese, uh, Spanish, 800 million speakers across the world and a remarkable one around this virtual table. Um, what The only thing I can say is that um, our policy at UPARI is to foster the development of all languages. 
uh, we have a focus on French, of course, because, you know, French happens to be, you know, uh, the national language. Um, you know, everyone is, um, you know, geared towards English as a sort of, uh, you know, second important language, but we have a focus on other languages and including Asian languages. Uh, we have a tradition of Asian languages and civilizations at Ipari that is very sturdy. We want to maintain a focus on Asia. And so it's not just, you know, French and English. Uh, I have to say to you, um, Baratong, that we don't have subtitles yet. Uh, maybe we need to invest in this, but the only thing I want to say is that we do have a focus on multilingualism uh, and we'll keep it up. Thanks. Um, last question from Alex Biotto. Do you think the lockdowns and lack of face-to-face -face meetings kill creativity? Uh, you know, with less serendipity and edge effects or increase it with less distraction and waste of time in useless meetings? Anyone who would like to reply to that question? Uh, maybe just one comment about this. Uh, I think that increase your creativity because you, you can be focused on the important task and then have free time to develop other skills uh but un until a certain point because after creativity alone you, you just stay a good idea so for me yes you can have a kind of uh, uh good thinking and uh, uh seed some new project but at one point you need to meet people and, and share your idea hearing that your idea is very stupid idea so how can you Im improve your idea so you go back to lockdown again and improve your idea and so you need communication at one point. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else would like to share something on that? So we had the case uh, during the circuit breaker. Uh, yeah. We have someone in the team uh, who had to build, I would say, a roadmap on a topic. And, and this is typically the kind of exercise where you need to meet people to get imbibed by what they think and create uh, out of that a plan. Uh, um, quite, I would say, uh, upstream uh, activity, uh, plan on, on upstream activities. Um, that guy did it very, very well. So what I think is that, as, as Thomas said, there is a time for it. I think it's, it's good to be, um, to, to, to back up like that. Uh, and uh, and so there is a time, but there are some people that are made for that or not. Uh, there are some people, they, they cannot do anything without multiple interaction. Uh, Others uh, who like like that person who really uh, by discussing one by one, one to one with people, building his idea of of the topic, um, ideas around the topic, could deliver something. I, I was my, I was quite impressed to see that result. It was really during the circuit breaker. So, and himself, he came back from Cambodia. So he was two weeks in quarantine at home in his little flat. <laughs> the same could not cross the doorstep. So um, yeah, there are times for that and some people that are made for that and others not at all. So I think it's just a new opportunity to, to, uh, to, to put some people more, tell them stay at home you work three or four days from home, it's better for you because we know that they are going to create more uh, by themselves and others, no, no, stay, come to office five days a week because we know these ones, uh, they will be more creative while uh, interacting uh, with others. Thank you, Alexander. So I, I promise I finished on time. It's uh, 7.05 in Singapore. I guess it's um, 12.05 in Paris. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. I suggest that we all give a virtual round of applause. And um, thank you uh, to the French Embassy in Singapore and to the French Lab. I invite you to join the French Lab if you haven't done so. Uh, now we can, you can also join from France. So those who are not in Singapore, we don't have face-to-face <laughs> -face meetings yet, but we hope we'll be able to have them soon so thank you very much have a good evening and have a good day and hope to see you very soon thank, thank you, you very much, Mariana. <laughs> bye